emphasis on family. This is the main ingredients of the, su the survival of the Jews as a race and as a community and as a nation, without a nation, even way before the Holocaust, throughout history. This is, I think, focusing on two things, focusing on keeping the family united, and the family bond, and also adhering to a certain practices is, it, is what got them is is what got them connected across different countries even after they lost their homeland and I think because these are the reasons why they're still around they didn't recognize that as the main principles that they need to fight for and defend remember how we saw like a children museum where we were before it seems like to be a lot of focus on children how you says the children's children are the crown of the elders and the glory of children are their fathers. I think there's a picture of the children here. I want to know what what is all the philosophy and the belief regarding there seems to be a lot of emphasis on how to unvaluing children and how you bring them up. There's a lot of things that we need to ask and there's a lot of people that we need to talk to. I mean this is some of the propaganda when the when the Nazis were coming into power. You see here. Rise of the Nazis, and it's interesting because they're part of the Nazi propaganda. They, they were connecting their opposition. Yeah, they were linking the leftist parties to like Jewish caricatures, like their families, and also to communists. But they, they presented themselves very well. The Nazis in this propaganda poster, they're combining both their enemies in one monster. Like, it's, look, it has both the Jewish symbol on it and the communist symbol on it. As the main forces that is destroying Germany, they basically look at the look at communism and the Jews as the main problems of Germany. But here, like, they're combining them all together and in one caricature. So they're like both anti-communist and anti-Semitic, targeting it both in one poster. You know, one thing that these posters help show is that a lot of like some new uh, people, the alt new alt-right people or neo-Nazi people that want to defend uh, Hitler's policy, they usually say, oh, it wasn't about racism, it was about saving Germany. Um, but, you know, there's so many posters from there that shows that how much how much racism was involved. It's uh, so amazing that people say that, that kind of stuff with the amount of evidence that was involved. Ooh, this is interesting. This, this is basically showing that the, the, this is an anti-race mixing poster that is, that is suggesting that's the, that's the Achilles heel of the, the Aryan race. Even be before the Holocaust, happens, uh, we get to see what, with the rise of the Nazi power, you get to see how the anti-Jewish measures start increasing. One thing that uh, they did used to do, like the people that didn't have um, Jewish names, which was hard to know that they were Jewish, they, ma they forced them to change their names to have like names like Israel or Sarah in them, just to, so that they could sh make sure that these people can easily be identified as Jews. So this is a document of a name change. And this other document here is a document that is a declaration of assets because all the Jews had to declare, the, the Nazi Germany made all the Jews declare exactly all the assets they had. And also they restricted their access to their own bank accounts. And then these are documents from there. Again, a lot more evidence even before we get into the Holocaust of how anti-Jewish the regime was getting. So after that, they seem to, this is when things are getting even worse. This is, what, 1935, I think? This guy, this is a, uh, a Jewish armband, one of them. This, this is what, this was the one this guy was wearing, what's his name, Lazar. Um, so we saw that they, earlier, that they had to change their name so that they could ide be identified easier. But now they're make. This is the point in time that they are actually making the Jews wear armband as well, so that they could be identified as Jews in the streets. When the Nazis came to power, at first the anti-Semitic, the anti-Jewish measures, it kept on increasing gradually. It wasn't like Holocaust from the very beginning, and th that's why a lot of Jews didn't actually leave at the right from the beginning, and because they thought that this is a, just a temporary thing, it might not be as bad. Um, maybe they could just, you know, adjust their lives, and this will go away at some point. But I think this, is, but based on what it says here, November 10, 1938, was the day that um, a lot of Jewish people realized how bad things are turning out. 
This was the day that November, actually it's November 9th, 1938, the Nazi organized mobs that they attacked and destroyed synagogues, 1400 synagogues, looted 7500 Jewish owned shops and murdered 91 Jews. And this is still nothing compared to what's going to come next. But this is when, when the Jews under Nazi regime re realized how bad things are getting. They attacked Jewish homes, 30, they imprisoned 30,000 30, Jewish men. Wow. Um, and again, a lot of people, when they compare this to, the, to, to what comes after, a lot of people don't seem that that that's, looks like a big deal. But even though we looked at some of the hardship that the Jews went through before this, this was a new level for them. This was a completely a different level of hostility and oppression for the Jews under Nazi regime at the time, not knowing how much worse things are about to get. Also, they made it, at this point, it, they made it very difficult for Jews, like the Jews that left before all this, they were the lucky ones, because at this point it was becoming very difficult for people to leave. So this is the part that now things are getting a lot more intense. They have, now they have ghettos um, all across um, Nazi controlled areas, but especially it seems Poland, where a lot of the Jews uh, were now living under Nazi regime. And these are thousands of people, and since that the, the death rate was 50%. And if you can see here, they all had their, had to have their identification. Now they all had their own work permits. They were keeping a very close eye on all of them. But now they're completely separated, and now they're living under, under completely different conditions things are like getting way worse as very fast and I imagine if you were living under those conditions you would think that this is the peak of madness now like this is the worst it could we didn't think it could get this bad but now this is the worst situation not knowing what's what's about to come next one thing I uh, what I notice is when I talk to neo-nazis and anti-semites and um, a lot of people on the far right is that there they have put all a lot of their anti-Jewish propaganda in Holocaust denial. I'm not entirely sure why that is the main thing that they're focusing on. That's something I want to understand and that's something I also want to make it clear in a very obvious way by talking to people, uh, talking to experts, talking to historians, go through a journey to show the evidence for the Holocaust and the evidence for the numbers behind it. And to do that, I want to go to Auschwitz, I want to go to Berlin, I want to go to uh, Jerusalem, I want to talk to different people, I want to look at all the records, I want to, and I need your help on that. I want you guys to let me know the places where you think I need to go, the people you think I need to talk to, and the information that I need to look up. I don't want to just read other people's evidence for it and, and other people's opinions on it. I want to actually go there and show you guys what I see on the ground and report it back to you. One thing amazing about um, Holocaust deniers is that they're denying one of the mass murder of a group of people, one of the genos one of the genocides in history that was the most documented one. So it's very interesting that the genocide the, that they picked to deny is the one that was, you know, Nazis did an amazing job at documenting everything. They took pictures of everything. They listed everything. Uh, they were very obsessed with making sure they do things efficiently and that involved documentation and because of docu that documentation there's a lot of records and proof for a lot of the stuff that happened and you can see like there's a lot of pictures of all the prisoners of all the suitcases that they left behind prison pictures um, every you know there's as we go by you will see the rest of it as well but the the thing is that you can't just when you present the evidence, what people will do is that claim that this propaganda and it's made up information, right? And it's evidence that was made to convey a certain uh, story that never happened. So what we need to figure out is not only, you know, a lot of the, I know a lot of people say, oh, people that are that far gone, 
they're too, it's too late for them, that there's no way, there are some people that you don't talk to. But the thing is that these movements, they grow, they grow, and there are people at some point, especially younger people that join, right? So, and there are a lot of ex-Nazis, ex-neo-Nazis, ex-anti-Semites. Um, so you can't give up on people. And what we need to figure out is how to reach the peop people that might be a little bit skeptical or how to introduce skepticism to, a lot of, to people that have already made up their mind. Part of that involves in not just presenting the evidence, but to figure out how to show that this is credible information, as how credible evidence. And that's something that I want to figure out how to do most effectively. And for that, I don't, I, I don't want to only just talk to historians, but also talk to people that um, came out of those groups on those ideas and figure out what was it that changed their mind and see what, how that this evidence could be presented in a, w uh, in a way that shows that they're credible, that shows that they, that they need to be convinced by it. And that's something I, I don't know how to do yet and how to communicate that, but that's something that I'm going to try to figure out. One interesting thing is that, see there's a lot of, there are a lot of gypsies here as well that were in these camps. The interesting thing is that you don't see any denial of the gypsies being murdered and that I don't know which is interesting right it's only the Jewish murders that are being denied and questioned which suggests some bias right now we're in the I think what the phase we are right now in is the information discovery phase and we're just trying to figure out learn more about it and also to, to get a direction of where we want to look and what, we, what do we want to look for. Um, once we pass this phase, then we're going to have a better roadmap, a better plan on the direction that we want to go with all of this. And I need a lot of feedback from everybody on this. What this is about is mostly just seeing some of the, what, what people are that are not experiencing the evidence and the records firsthand, what are they presented with, and then go and, be, and to, to use that to get a better understanding of this, the stories, the documents, the details, and then go talk to the relevant people that would know. Then the next phase is to talk to the people that know, that could give us a guide on where to look for and what to look for, and then actually go there and see it firsthand. There's a lot of picture evidence here as well. These are the where are these? These are the gypsy boys that they did experiments on. And this is the this is actually a picture from 1944 of the bodies that they were burning in ditches. This is an actual picture from the camp that was smuggled out. And this one, this is an actual picture of the ovens right next to the bodies. These are the skeletons of the bodies. Look right next to the ovens that they used to burn in. Again, these are, there's, so much, there's so many pictures and documents to show this, but the, the problem with the deniers is that they, make, they say that all of this is made up. And that's absurd, but just thinking that it's absurd is, is not going to kill these ideas. You have to actually go and show exactly how you, can clear, you could clearly tie these, these pictures and the evidence to events that, uh, that actually happened. These are actually, these are the pictures um, of their lives, of all the victims, before all the nightmares started. Basically to demonstrate that these people had hopes and dreams and things to live for. You know, one thing I did just a couple of weeks ago was I went and met with a few new Nazis and I had a discussion with them regarding their conspiracy theories, Jewish conspiracy theories, and um, their Holocaust denial. And, you know, you get, I get a lot of um, pushback and criticism regarding why would you talk to some peop to people like that, right? But I think that discussion really, and discussion with people like that, and a lot more other people that are maybe don't identify as Nazis or neo-Nazis or whatever they call themselves, um, or even just your average anti 
uh, anti-Semite, is that the more conversations I have with them, the more I could I know what we're dealing with. The more I'm going to be equipped with, um, with the direction we want to head to, which would be the most effective way of fighting these ideas. And again, a lot of people t- say that these people, you're not going to change their ideas. And again, the response to that is, well, we have we have changed people's opinions on many other. Um, ideas. I mean, we know we know former ISIS members that are now atheists, former uh, jihadis that are now atheists, or they, they're, they're ch- former radical people that are not. And this is no different. We also know former Nazis, former neo Nazis, former white nationalists. The only way to understand how you could encourage more of that and encourage scaling that on a much higher level is to first understand them, understand the, the structure of their ideas and understand the arguments that they make and their, their own the propaganda that they have and the, the lines that they use. And once you do that, once you have that foundation, then the second phase is to go and do, re- and do research and also go talk to the people that have talked and that have experienced talking to these groups of people and see what they're doing and to figure out which try out different methods, do trial and uh, trial and error, and see what works, what resonates, what makes them. Some people think a little bit. When some people go from being 100% certain, maybe that the Holocaust never happened, to having a little bit of a doubt, and then maybe even completely change people's opinions. You, if, you don't, if you don't talk to them, there is no way you can understand where to even start. You could just ignore these people and you just could dismiss them as crazy, you could just dismiss them as a, a wacky extremist, but that's, uh, ignoring them is exactly what they need for them to grow. Um, people sometimes say, why would you give these people a, plat- a platform? Um, the thing is that not uh, uh, you know why would you give them an audience? The problem is that the, the, this, these kind of ideas are having a, such a major comeback because people didn't recognize them as a threat because people they weren't exposed. And now that we now that we are um, exposing some, to some of our fans, some of our fans are now which might have not been interested in, t- in a topic like this, see that as how toxic and how big of a problem it is for for it to for us to need a response for us to have to go and and not not that there hasn't been a response these things there's so much evidence for this that is some is is some people might even uh, don't not understand why would you need a response this is so well documented this is there's so much research behind all this but it's not about just presenting the evidence that's the next step that we're going to follow but after that is about one thing that I have been, my, me and my team have been successful with is convincing a lot of people out of Islamic ideology. So we have a lot of experience with that, but, well, but we also was part of that com- were part of that community and we understood the arguments that, the Isla- um, that people in the Islamic community make. So we, we want to take that model, but also equip ourselves with the evidence and at the same time use the same model to see not just if we can present the evidence but what is the best way to communicate it and what's the best way to get to these groups and have a discussion with them in a way that they they feel encouraged to come talk to us right because a lot of people just point at nazis point at anti-semites point at neo-nazis and just call racist evil punch them in the face, but there's, I, I met a lot of ex-Nazis, none of them have ever became an ex-Nazi, people that identified as Nazi, I know a lot of people say there's no such thing as Nazi anymore, people that identified as Nazis, that are now called themselves ex-Nazis, and none of them have changed their opinions because somebody punched them in the face, but there are a lot of them that have changed their opinions, so there is something that works, and I just want to figure out what is that that works, and scale that. One of the main evidences for the Holocaust is all the all the stories that people told after they experienced it and these are diff- many different places from many different uh, that went to into many different places and they, their stories match and the fact that the stories match and their account that they experienced uh, this is basically what you do when you're doing detective work you separate people and you get them the stories and see if their story, stories match with each other and given the n- number of people that came out of the camps and the different people that had the stories to tell that it would be almost it's almost impossible to deny the fact that the, how much they matched how much their stories uh, basically matched the evidence the their hard evidence that they found and how much their stories basically confirmed each other's 
all right guys so that was it let us know what you think let us know which directions you think we should go uh, we should go what questions we need to ask who we need to speak to let us know what we missed some important points that we need to bring up that because of lack of knowledge we are not touching on we're not paying attention to or anything you disagree with anything you think um, that we're getting completely wrong or is if it's even worth doing what we're trying to do here any any comments that you have um, please let us know and please you know I want you guys to be as much involved with this project as possible I'm gonna try to read and you know think about as all the comments no matter how much out there they are no matter how much you disagree with them I'm, I'm gonna take all of them very seriously so thank you for everybody that is you know supporting us thank you for everybody that's following this and thank you for everybody that's encouraging us and thank you especially to the people that are guiding us and giving us feedback we are creating this content independently we rely on fan support to be able to cover all our costs if you are a fan of this type of content please support us there are a couple of different ways that you guys could support us in the description uh, these kind of content do cost money uh, we have to, we have a lot of expenses to cover uh, if you want uh, this kind of underground uh, investigative content where we go into into the communities we talk to different people with from different communities and their leaders uh, and ask them firsthand and you know ask them the questions that you know the that you know we're good at uh, please consider supporting us uh, we do need we need we really do need your support to be able to continue with this project